Hi everybody, thank you for coming out to the Berwick Public Library. This is, um, thank goodness, a beautiful night and hopefully it'll stay nice and warm for us. We have a great program tonight. I want to introduce you to Bob Keys. And Bob is a Berwick resident, and I'll start with that because I am so impressed. He's also a wonderful speaker and a writer of a brand new book, and it's called The Isolation Artist. But it, Bob's gonna tell you all about that. Let me tell you about him. Bob has worked as a journalist for the past four decades and is now with the Portland Press Herald and the Maine Sunday Telegram. He is a nationally recognized arts writer and a storyteller with specialties in American visual arts and contemporary culture of New England. He has received numerous awards for his writing, including the Rabkin Prize for Visual Arts Journalism in recognition of his contributions to the National Arts Dialogue. Bob is here tonight to talk about his debut book and he is also going to tell us about the recluse millionaire artist, Robert Indiana, who died in 2018 at his home in Vinyl Haven, Maine. It was left behind with scandal and deception, and it is going to be an exciting book for us to learn about. And in talking to Bob before we started, I had no idea that there was so much behind this book. I can't wait to read it. Um, so please, welcome Bob Keys. Thanks. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thanks for the great introduction. Thanks uh, to the library and to, to Berwick TV for coming out to, to film this. That's a great honor. And also to Kelly from Kelly's Books to Go. She has books in the back if you're interested. So they're the ones who made this happen. So I only, all I had to do was walk up here. I live 10 minutes away on Logan Street and have lived in Berwick for, I don't know, nine years or so, I think, something like that. And, uh, and I work at the Press Herald. I cover the arts for the newspaper in Portland, and I've been doing that since 2002. And in the course of my job, right away, I became a f a familiar with and met Robert Indiana. I had to write about him right away for various reasons. And uh, he became somebody I wrote about a lot over the course of uh, the many years that uh, I knew him, 16 years specifically. And um, I did stories for the newspaper uh, every few years about exhibitions and tried to talk to him about his estate and what he was going to do with that and, and various things. And then when he died in 2018, I began writing about this lawsuit that had dogged his final days in fact, his final day, perhaps, and uh, has become this uh, sordid affair that has lasted now three years and will be going on four in terms of the legal case. Uh, so, to put some context behind it all, Robert Indiana uh, was born on September 13th, in 1928, in uh, Indiana, and his name was Robert Clark, and he had a very difficult childhood, um, was adopted at birth, and lived in 21 different physical homes in his first 17 years. His parents moved around uh, a lot. They had trouble holding down jobs. They had a lack of stability in their lives. And eventually they divorced and Robert Indiana moved back among their houses. And he had no stability in his youth. And he, had, he never learned the ability to trust people or, or to put down roots. And um, those characteristics really dogged him throughout his life, and especially after he moved to Vinyl Haven and uh, became somewhat secluded by choice. And that caught up with him at the end. But uh, he, he became an artist um, because that's what he did well, and, and uh, that's where he felt most comfortable. And he came to Maine originally in 1953 to attend the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and uh, liked Maine enough to sort of keep in the back of his mind. And, uh, and he became most famous in the mid-1960s for creating an image of the word love, L-O-V-E, with four letters, two over two with the tilted O. And that became a cultural phenomenon beginning in mid-1960s, 1965 specifically. And um, in 1973, it became a U.S. postage stamp. 
And then in 1976, a big public art sculpture in Philadelphia of love debuted, and it's sort of become part of the American cultural lexicon, if you will, since its creation. But he, he never copyrighted that image, and he never um, did anything to protect himself from it being pirated. And while love became exceptionally well known, Indiana really resented it because uh, it became better known than he was. and he really never made any money off of it until he got a thousand dollars from the u.s postal service in 73 he only made money of the original images that he made of it and sold in a gallery and so um he came to maine in 1978 a bitter man uh, because he felt he had been mistreated by the new york art world uh, he didn't like being labeled as a pop artist and he he wanted to have a new beginning, and he saw Maine as a place where that could happen. He, he didn't understand at that point how, how ingrained Vinyl Haven was in his life even before he got out there, but he later discovered that uh, the, the um, granite from the Brooklyn Bridge near where he had his studio in New York was made with granite from Vinyl Haven, and he worked at a cathedral in New York when he first got there. In fact, he was in the cathedral when he decided to change his name to Robert Indiana in 1958, and that cathedral was built with Vinyl Haven granite. And so this thread of Vinyl Haven percolated throughout his life although he really wasn't aware of it until he moved out there in 78. So, um, he, uh, he, as I said, he went out there a bitter man and he continued to make art and his life sort of sputtered along um, with some success and, and um, some ups and downs, if you will. And then he reached a very difficult period of time in the 1990s. He was accused of sexual abuse, he was brought up on charges, and he was acquitted. He was judged guilty by pe people on the island, and he had a very difficult time on the island from that point on. He probably had a difficult time at the island before that, but especially after that. And he went into a funk and a depression, and uh, he didn't pay his taxes for many years. And uh, he got into financial distress and social distress, and, and that's when the isolation began. He lived in the Star of Hope, which was this huge three-story building uh, right in the heart of Vinyl Haven, right on the water. It was very visible and he turned it into his museum and he did that on purpose soon after he became there. It was the one place he could make his own, the one place he could reclaim as a stable place. And as time went on, that place that he was so proud of became um, uh, somewhat of a, of a castle and, uh, and, and later it really did help uh, block him in. So he became, he became isolated beginning in the 1990s. And then, um, desperate, uh, an art group came into his life, named the Morgan Art Foundation, and they offered him a lifeline. They bailed him out financially, and they started circulating his artwork, and um, he, he resurrected his career. And uh, he began making more meaningful art that was based on his time in Maine. And he started coming out of his shell. He started getting exhibitions uh, in, in France and across the United States. And he started making money again. And uh, life became pretty good for him. And uh, that all worked out really well for 10 years. And then you may be familiar with a piece that he also made called Hope. It was a sculpture very much like love four letters, two over two with the tilted O. In fact, it was manufactured just down the road here in Elliott, Maine, by a group of uh, recent Ma Mass College of Art graduates who opened up a, a foundry and a business in Elliott. And uh, they were the ones that uh, one of Robert Indiana's other art dealers contracted to make Hope. Hope created conflict in Robert Indiana's life because it created conflict between his art dealers. The folks from the Morgan Art Foundation who offered him a lifeline saw this other guy named Michael McKenzie who started doing business with Indiana in earnest in 2008 as being in direct conflict with their business plan. And so um, the book that I wrote is about that conflict and how that showed up in the lawsuit 10 years later. The lawsuit was filed on May 18th 2018, and he is said to have died on May 19th, 2018, the next day. He had been very sick and um, had been in end-of-life care, but there's a lot of suspicion about his death. And I quote a few people in the book who are beyond a doubt that he died on Friday, May 18th, and that his death 
is being obscured somewhat. Um, the autopsy was undetermined. The cause of death and the manner of, uh, manner of death were both ruled undetermined, and it rem both remain that way now. His body was whisked off the island and prepared for cremation, and it wasn't until a lawyer from the Morgan Art Foundation intervened when they learned about his death, when we all learned about his death on Monday, May 21st, and asked the FBI to get involved. And the FBI ordered an autopsy. And, um, and so there's a lot of mystery and a lot of intrigue. And um, I tell the story from the perspective of my interactions with him over the years, as well as from my covering the lawsuit for the newspaper. Um, I've, I've written about this lawsuit since the day he died, and, um, and I'm still writing about it because it continues, although a big part of it has been settled, uh, a large chunk of it continues. And so rather than go over all the details of what's in the lawsuit and how things unfolded, I'm going to read a few sections of the book that offer some, um, well, some insight into the story and sort of what the book is about. And, and how it feels. And I should say, this is the first event I've done at a, at a library in Maine, which is a great honor. And that also means it's the first actual reading that I've done, other than Luke, who's in seventh grade. I haven't read to anybody in quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's a little of an exaggeration. I read the other night, but it was only a small section. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. By the time he reached 80, well, I'm sorry. See, I have to set it up. This, this scene takes place in, on September 13th, 2008, at his 80th birthday party on Vinyl Haven. I, had, I was sent out to the island to cover it for the newspaper. By the time he reached 80 in September 2008, Robert Indiana's broken heart showed itself in the hollow edges of his eyes. They had been intimidatingly sharp up until then, but the artist's eyes looked tired as he stood passively in the kitchen of a longtime friend, shifting from foot to foot and looking away as the two men who most controlled the fate of his legacy, the art consultant and one-time London gallerist Simon Salamacaro, and the New York art publisher and sometimes artist Michael McKenzie, chatted about his past and future as a great American image maker. They talked about him as if he weren't even there, as if he were already dead. If his eyes told the truth, he was well on his way. Outside, it was a glorious fall day on Vinyl Haven, a sprawling, wooded main island that entices with its mystery, elusiveness, and seclusion. Many artists disappeared along the main coast, and most, and the most hardy and adventurous choose islands as their hideaway. Vinyl Haven isn't a hobby artist's island. It is beautiful and rugged with its tall red spruce, balsam firs, and paper birch trees and deep granite quarries, but it is not quaint. Those who come from away have their work cut out to earn the respect of the island's hard-working, year-round residents. This is true of all Maine towns, but islands ask even more of newcomers. In addition, Indiana was openly gay in a community not known for its tolerance, particularly, particularly in the 1970s when he arrived. So here he was, on the occasion of his 80th birthday in the kitchen of an island friend, with Simon Salmacaro and Michael McKenzie discussing him as though he were more a commodity than a man, feeling betrayed by those he trusted most to look out for him both in art and in life. Outside the kitchen door, a few dozen of Indiana's friends from the island and art worlds of Maine, New York, and France had descended to celebrate the icon's birthday. The host, Indiana's loyal island friend, Pat Nick, founder of Vinyl Haven Press, where Indiana expended considerable creative energy, had assembled all the right people. There was sculpture in the garden, a huge cake on the patio table, an oversized love birthday card that everyone signed. And indeed, despite the unease in the kitchen, there was much to celebrate. So, for some context, the month before the party, the Hope Sculpture had been debuted at the Democratic National Convention in uh, Denver and had been adopted by the Obama campaign uh, as its motif, not the sculpture itself, but the idea of hope. And uh, you may recall that eventually posters were made with the theme of hope, not the image that Indiana created, but the idea that Indiana had uh, encouraged with that sculpture. The morning of that party, uh, Simon Salamacaro had shown up on the island and Indiana had 
tra taken him to his studio and shown him that in addition to the Hope sculpture that Michael McKenzie helped create right here in Elliot, he had also created a whole bunch of love paintings that Simon Salamakaro saw as nothing more than silkscreen prints that were being passed off as original Indiana paintings. And he knew at that moment that things were askew and that he was going to have trouble. So he realizes this that morning. And then uh, at some point afternoon, uh, Indiana had this birthday party. And uh, it did not go well. I mean, the party went off fine. But I remember leaving there feeling that uh, there was conflict in that kitchen. And I sensed it. And, and as I say, Indiana was just backing away from the conversation as it was going around, uh, around him. That was my first clue although I didn't realize it at the time, but that was my first clue that something was amiss and that there was conflict in his life. So <clears throat> I'm going to read another section that creates just a little bit more context with some of those characters, and then we'll see where we go from there. The story of Robert Indiana's final days is more than a legal drama. It's also, also the story of what happened in the dark recesses of the Star of Hope among men who fought for control of Indiana's legacy and money. It's a tragedy of Shakespearean machinations involving a failing king full of rage who rarely emerged from his castle, the plotting, manipulative knights who fought over his crown and jewels, and the loyal and innocent pawns on either side of the widening moat filled with chaos and acrimony. Tensions had been simmering since Indiana's 80th birthday when Simon Salamakaro felt blindsided by Mackenzie pushing hope into the world and exerting more influence on Indiana's creative life. Salamakaro's concerns grew acute in 2013 when Mackenzie purchased a house on Vinyl Haven and began spending more time away from his office and studio in New York and more time with the artist in Maine. Simon Salamakaro had invest and Morgan Art had invested millions of dollars in Indiana over several decades, helped him realize his dreams of creating a massive collection of sculptures, and landed him the Whitney retrospective, a late career highlight. Sara Macalo, Salamakaro intended to protect his investment. Early in 2014, Salamakaro's grown son, Mark, showed up at the Star of Hope to huddle with the artist about Mackenzie's growing influence on Indiana's artwork. Like his father, Mark Salamakaro is suave, quiet, and polite, and impeccably dressed. He runs an art consulting business that is associated with Morgan Art. The men in the living room on the second floor with its built-in cabinets where the odd fellows stored their regalia they met in that room. Indiana wore a heavy white sweater, appropriate for the season, black trousers and loafers. He sat in a metal chair with the, his, a cup of his favorite freeze-dried coffee on a table behind, beside him. Mark told Indiana he had been to the Miami Art Fair in December 2013 and saw an 18-inch sculpture attributed to Indiana called Chai, C-H-A-I, the Hebrew word for life. Indiana said he had no knowledge of the work and told him Mackenzie must have made it. Quote, and you say you've never seen one, Mark asked, his English accent rising with the question. No, no, Indiana replied in his quavering, faltering voice. And you never authorized that, no? No, and I don't like it, Indiana said, and clasped, clasped, his, clasped his bony hands. How do we restrain Michael, he asked. Help me, how does one restrain Michael? He's beyond me. Indiana laughed quietly to himself and, and called Mackenzie mischievous under his breath. But he also confessed to Mark that he was afraid of Mackenzie and described him as a loose cannon and out of control. So that is the, the sort of the, the background that Indiana was operating in over the last few years of his life. He signed the contracts with Mackenzie and the tension grew over the years in 2003 and 2004 and 2013 and 14. And, uh, and um, various things happened, but one of the key things that happened in 2015 was the death of a librarian, of course. Uh, the librarian on Vinyl Haven Island uh, watched out over Indiana, uh, took care of his personal affairs and some of his business affairs, and sort of helped navigate the chaos in the studio. So I'm just going to read another section about that, and then we'll move on. It's a short one. Mm -hmm. In October 2015, Indiana's personal assistant, an island resident named Valerie Morton, died. Morton, the local li librarian, had looked after Indiana's 
personal affairs and finances for years. She was an unofficial gatekeeper and a trusted advisor who served as co-executor of Indiana's estate. Morton was a strong female presence in an environment of mostly men. She was loyal and protective and a fair referee. But most important, she was someone Indiana relied on someone Indiana relied on and to always hold his best interests at the top of her mind. She respected and cared for Indiana as a human being. He'd become Bob to so many. She called him Robert. Quiet, unassuming, and apolitical in the studio, she was organized and efficient. Characteristics she carried over from her work as a librarian. She kept the peace and she kept the order. She was no nonsense. Morton lived and dressed simply and had little awareness of or interest in the roles of outsiders like Simon Salamacaro and others played in Indiana's career and life. She wasn't easily impressed and she looked at Simon Salamacaro with suspicion. Then again, she was suspicious of almost everyone who called on Indiana from London, New York, or even Portland, Maine largest city. Morton didn't suffer fools. Indiana benefited from her instincts. He was fond of her, and she seemed genuinely fond of him. And when she died, it all went to heck. Um, Indiana died in 2018. The lawsuit was filed either the day before or the day after he died, and, and uh, um, things have fallen into acrimony. So I, I wrote this book essentially because I was told that I had to. This was uh, um, uh, that's uh, that's actually the truth. The publisher from Boston, from Godine, who I who who also lives in Maine. He's from kind of Bunkport. Everything is very local. He is a former newspaper reporter, and he he sent me an email in January or so of 2020, and said someone is going to write this book and it should be you because nobody knows that story better and can tell it from as many perspectives and um, i had half-heartedly pitched the idea sometime in the fall before to a new york publisher or, or a new york agent and was quickly dismissed because the case was still ongoing and there was no resolution to the mystery and i was told when everything's resolved come back so I figured that was pretty good advice, but Josh said, don't wait, the story can be told now, and let's start doing it. So he, he basically gave me an assignment uh, to write 30,000 words before December of 2020, and um, I signed the contract to do so on March 8th, and then of course, four days later, we Actually, shut down. We had a pandemic. We had, we had a, time to write a book. <laughs> exactly right. That, that is my wife and Vicki, and she's exactly right. I'm shocked in hindsight that I agreed to do this before the pandemic hit. But um, I work in Portland, and I have not been worked. I have not worked a day in the office since hmm. March 12th. Um, and so I have been. I used every one of the extra 10 hours a week I save not commuting working on this book and I spent all of my vacation last year working on the book and um, the process was very challenging and it took all of my time and um, all of my energy um, but it made sense for me to do it because uh, the opportunity was there and I was writing about the story for the paper and it was fresh in my mind and I had an editor both at the newspaper and an editor at the publishing house that both pushed me to keep doing this story. And I had a wife and a stepson who tolerated the fact that I was working every weekend and all of our vacation on this book. And uh, I just want to say, and then I promise I'll stop and take questions, um, with, with Josh, the editor, living, in, uh, living now in Biddeford and being born in Kennebunk and us living literally right around the corner on Logan Street, all of the work on this book, almost all of the creativity behind this book was done in a relatively short radius of this library in this town. And uh, this is very much a main project. It has some, hopefully, has some national implications, but it really is about Maine people and done by Maine people. And uh, um, it's, it's just sort of, it's, well, first of all, it's great to be able to sort of start our library tour, if you will, here at Berwick, but uh, it's really, gratifying to to be involved in, in a local project like this and be able to see it to fruition in such a relatively short amount of time so i'm not going to tell you what happens because the story is still evolving and you need you should read the book and you can check it out here at the library um and other libra many other libraries in maine and we're, we're building that so anyway that's 
sort of what I prepared at this point, and I'm happy to take questions or keep rambling. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering if Indiana wanted the Star of Hope to be a museum. He did. What the status of that is. My husband and I were there this last summer, not this summer, and it was closed up, nothing going on there. Is that still in contention with the lawsuit? No, that has been resolved. That has been that. That is a great question. Um, the Star of Hope, Robert Indiana created the Star of Hope Foundation to manage his legacy after he died. And he created, when he moved into the Star of Hope, he saw that building on Vinyl Haven as his, a place for his artwork and a place for his life where he intended to live forever. And as I said before, it was the only place that he ever felt at home. He had great studios in New York where he started what he was able to complete at the Star of Hope. But I think every few years, five years and eight years, he lost his studios to development. And so he really couldn't even put down roots in New York, although he did. And he, he arrived at Vinyl Haven with the goal of turning that into his museum. And that's how he began living there from the very beginning in 1978. He moved out there in the summer of 78. 13 van loads of, of personal belongings and art back and forth from New York. Um, on the ferry from Rockland to the island, and then unloaded up a three-story house. He um, died with the full intention that the museum would be left as, it, as he left it, roughly. He had it outfitted with art. He grave tours of that place as if he were a studio, as if he were a gallery guide and a docent. That's when I first met him. You had the full tour of all three floors, as well as his studio. And uh, he was very proud of what he created. Um, the Star of Hope Foundation owns all the artwork, but the Star of Hope will not be a museum. It will be a place for education, um, uh, for art education. It, the, Indiana also owns three buildings, other buildings on the island, that will probably become or may become artist residencies. The Star of Hope, with a lot of influence from people on the island who did not necessarily like Indiana all that much, um, have favored the Star of Hope building reverting into the community use that it was before he, before he purchased it, but also before he purchased it, it had, been, it had been dilapidated and vacant. But in its early days, in its heyday, it was the Oddfellows Hall, and it was a gathering place for the community. And so it will become a community center again. Um, since you have been there, it has opened to the degree that it is hosting art shows by members of the community. And I don't know if the building itself is open to the public as much as art is being shown in the public spaces of the building looking out on a main street. But there are efforts definitely underway to create a very public space out there. And TBA and the museum, uh, there may be some, there's a lot of artwork at play. It's gonna be exhibited somewhere. Perhaps there'll be a space built on the mainland. There is a lot of concern that not enough people would visit a museum per se on Vinyl Haven to justify it and a lot of people on the island don't want a museum and a lot of people don't want too much remembrance of Robert Indiana. Well I heard after he died uh, there were newspaper photos of his artwork being carried out. That's by correct. Well they had no idea so does somebody have all of it someplace? Yes so yeah this is great. Um, <laughs> no it's, it's true. Okay so as soon as the Morgan Art Foundation on, on May 21st heard about uh, his death, in addition to wanting an autopsy, they wanted to make sure the art wasn't pilfered from the Star Hope. They owned a lot of that work and they had a lot of interest in it and they didn't want it taken out of there. And so, uh, but at the same time, um, the people on the island who were in charge of Indiana's estate, they didn't trust the Morgan Art Foundation and were afraid of the Morgan Art Foundation breaking into the Star of Hope and taking the art and they hired Pinkerton Security. To, to, to patrol the Star of Hope. Um, and and uh, a lot of artwork was taken out of the Star of Hope. And there is a lot of question where it ended up. And that has been negotiated through the settlement that remains under uh, confidentiality. Uh, but one thing I will say is um, I was out there in June or July of 2018, and I believe I was the first reporter in the Star of Hope after he died. And that was when uh, art movers had been hired to, to remove the rest of, to pack and officially move the art. And um, they moved out truckloads and truckloads of art to over where? the course of several days. To where? To uh, art storage facilities on the mainland. Um, uh, court documents suggest, well, court documents confirm that uh, there's a, a climate-controlled storage facility on Riverside Road in Portland that is used by Maine Historical and a few other places, and a lot of the artwork is there.
I don't know how much is there, but a lot of it, are, a lot of it is there. And so they took it out of the Star of Hope because the Star of Hope was falling apart. The other thing to know about the Star of Hope, and this is essential, it was in much worse condition than anybody realized. And they have spent the time since um, spending a lot of his money uh, um, fixing the Star of Hope, not cosmetically, but structurally, with steel beams running uh, from the top down to the bottom because the building was joined. There were two buildings joined historically, I think in 1888. And... Uh, they bowed, they started bowing out onto Main Street, and the architect from Rockport thought that probably within 10 years, the front of that building would have blown out onto Main Street. And if he were still alive, he probably would have died in a collapse, wow. which would have been incredibly fitting. I mean, I mean really. I mean, in a cloud of dust. Yeah. Yes. Can you say more about the Morgan Art yes. Company? Yes. So, God, I don't know, retro that a art company Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, well, there's a lot of layers to their relationship with Indiana. Um, the Morgan Art Foundation, in many ways, played the role of the old-time arts patron for Indiana. They gave him the means to do the projects he wanted to do, and then they benefited from it financially. Simon Salamacaro presented himself as Robert Indiana's agent in the art world, and also the representative of Morgan Art Foundation as an advisor to Morgan Art Foundation, but not an officer and in no way officially involved with the Morgan Art Foundation. But he, when he and Indiana began their relationship in the mid-1990s when he owned a gallery and he had a success, and he lobbied Indiana to show his work with him. And Indiana reluctantly agreed. And uh, they had some success at that show. And, and Indiana wanted to establish more of a relationship with Simon Salamacaro, and he challenged Simon to come up with enough money that Indiana could turn, turn a lot of the um, artwork that he had created, three-dimensional work, sculptures that he had created with uh, found objects, including um, large pieces of driftwood that had come up, into bronze. And he wanted love and other pieces turned into marble. And he considered those materials noble materials that would outlast all of us. And he knew that he wasn't going to be around, and a lot of his artwork probably wasn't going to last. But if he made it in marble, or if he made it in bronze, it would outlast all of us, and he would finally be remembered. And that was his goal. And so Simon Salamacaro began doing business uh, with these business people in, uh, in various places. They're actually, a private, they're a private for-profit company that's licensed in the Bahamas, and um, they provided all the financial means for... Simon Salmacaro to give Robert Indiana the money to do his work. And so that became uh, a very, I'm going to call it an insidious relationship. Indiana was down in his luck. He owed a lot of money, 600,000 bucks to the state of Maine. He had four liens taken on his house and uh, he was in bad shape. And uh, they sold some artwork and they helped him out. And as I said, they resurrected his career, but he owed everything to them. And um, they did everything. The Whitney, art, the Whitney retrospective in 2013 was something he wanted his entire career, and Morgan Art delivered that for them. So they gave him all he dreamed about and wanted, although he complained about it. But as we have learned, or what we suspect based on court filings, um, when Simon Salamacaro uh, arranged for artwork to be purchased, for Indiana's artwork to be purchased, he would turn right around and then sell it to someone else for a higher profit, often to other companies that he had created and to other people he knew from Morgan Art Foundation, his family and other people. And so he would pay Indiana on the sale price, but then sometimes in the same day, turn around and sell it for several hundred thousand dollars more. And then he would deduct the expenses charged with the second sale off of what Indiana's profit would have been. And that, that went on for a long time. Uh, and when Michael McKenzie got involved in Indiana's life in, 20, in 2008, one of his pitches to Indiana was, Morgan Art has been ripping you off, and we need to do something about that. And uh, it took a while, but eventually Indiana saw what Michael McKenzie was saying, and he, and he got really angry at Morgan Art Foundation. And the last few years that I communicated with him and that I knew him, I always heard how angry he was at Morgan Art and that he knew he was getting ripped off and he wanted somebody to do something about it. But he didn't want, he didn't like lawyers and he didn't want it to happen while he was alive. Uh, so, 
Jim Brannan, Rockland attorney, gets involved in Indiana's life in a big way in May 2016, rewrites his will, presents himself as executor of his estate, and puts an islander named Jamie Thomas in, um, in charge uh, as personal, uh, uh, personal attorney. Uh, do I have that right? No. Um, you're saying who, Thomas? Yeah, or? Jamie Thomas. Not, what's it? Uh, power of attorney. I'm sorry. Power of attorney. He appoints himself as, appoints Jamie Thomas as power of attorney. So they effectively take over his legal affairs, and Jamie Thomas also has medical power of attorney. So they exert nearly full control of Indiana's affairs beginning in May 2016. And they, and I, they're in the court documents, there are minutes of meetings and all kinds of things that show they. They, they did things to provoke Morgan Art knowing they wanted to get sued because if they got sued, they could expose Morgan Art's fraud. And that was all part of their strategy. And that's exactly how it all played out. But what Michael McKenzie also is accused of doing and what he no doubt did after he moved to the island in 2013, well, before that, he started making all kinds of artwork under Indiana's name that Indiana, that went far beyond his contracts with Hope. And Indiana may or may not have known about it. Um, he argued that once Jamie Thomas had power of attorney, he had the power to make Indiana's business decisions, and everything he did from that point on was legitimate. And so that part of the lawsuit is still playing out. But you had, you had an artist who had lost complete control of his legal affairs, and you had art dealers, some of whom did well by him, both of them did well by him ultimately, but they also took advantage of him, as did almost almost everybody else in his life. Mm. This is a sad, tragic story because he was alone and vulnerable in this huge mansion and he had nobody looking out for him. And part of that was because he was really hard to deal with and brought a lot of trouble on himself. All right. So be nice, that's what he's saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Let's talk about the librarian. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> Valerie Morton. She was the bright light. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Valerie that's Morton. Always, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I met Valerie, but I went out to the Star of Hope uh, to interview Indiana once and went out there for his 80th birthday party and various other times. But the people who knew him best say that as soon as Valerie died, the, the, the world really did become dark for him because she kept everything, not just in order business-wise, she would have noticed all the stuff going on. Mm. You know, she would have figured it out. But uh, she kept all the infighting at bay and she sort of insulated him. And um, he had other women in his life, uh, and I quote a few of them in the book, but Indiana had a hard time with women, and he really didn't trust women, and he, he admitted uh, to one of my sources in the book, who was his biographer, that he, he, was, he had an awkward relationship with women. And, um, uh, but, but Valerie Morton was someone that uh, he had a different kind of relationship with. She cooked for him, and he really appreciated her doting on him. And uh, um, yeah, when she when she she died of cancer, and and, and uh, as I say, at that point on, Jim Brannon became involved, and uh, everything happened within a few months after that. Everything started to happen within a few months after that. All right. So you're saying Jim Brannon was a bad influence? Uh, well, so there's always two sides, right? Yeah. Jim Brannon. So you may, I don't know how much you follow the news, but Jim Brannon is at odds right now with the Maine Attorney General for overcharging the Indiana estate um, significant amounts of money. Uh, I forget what the figure is right now, but Jim Brannon has made millions of dollars off of this estate. And he knew he was going to the moment he became executor of his will in May 2016. In fact, less than a week after Jim Brannon became executor of Robert Indiana's estate, Will, uh, he bought a condo in Florida for $680,000 cash. So that was within a, ca within a week. Okay. So, but Jim Brannon also will tell you the reason he ran up his fees as much as he did is because Indiana knew he was getting ripped off by Morgan Art and Jim Brannon was able to prove it by dragging out the case long enough. And by doing that, he, the case, they reached a settlement the day before Simon Salamakar was scheduled to testify, not testify, but to uh, be deposed, after one or both of his kids had been deposed. And so a lot of what they did not want exposed was in the process of coming out in their depositions, and they wanted to avoid that. And so the settlement was reached. 
And so Jim says, hey, you know what? You can criticize me all you want, and you can, you can try to reclaim these fees, but I did exactly what Indiana asked me to do. So, but, you know, I will say that when I started asking Jim difficult questions about things, he stopped talking. <laughs> and and he, he's never answered some questions. Yeah, but I, Jim, yeah, I don't know. Jim's an interesting guy. Jim, Jim was born and raised in Rockland, um, went to Suffolk University, served in Vietnam, went to Suffolk, and uh, came back to Rockland in 79 working in a law office. And he met Indiana soon after Indiana moved on Vinyl Haven because uh, Indiana was being accosted by a former maybe lover of his from New York. And Indiana was trying to settle in quietly and inconspicuously on Vinyl Haven. That was his hope. And he tried to take out a protection order against this person who showed up on the island. And, and Jim was part of a law firm who um, worked with him on that, although they couldn't take out a protection order because there was no reason to. But that was when Jim first met him in 1979. So he would say he's been involved in Indiana's life for a long, long time. Yep. OK. Other questions? For sure. One more time? He got out of hand for sure. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he, he made a lot of money in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Jim Brannon, so Jim Brannon, I'll, I'll, he's got a great story. Um, he is the classic relatively small town attorney. He's made his living doing real estate deals and wills and all the stuff people need to have done to make you know, a small town function. His office is a block from the courthouse and it's right, it's a block from the ferry terminal roughly. I mean, he's, you know, you can, he's in a perfect location. And uh, he also happens to be the personal attorney for the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, who owns an island in Maine, or at least a house on an island in Maine. And when he did that deal, Jim Brannon was his lawyer, was his lawyer and Jim became his personal attorney for all of his main business. So Jim is just not some podunk guy. He's got some of the highest, most influential <laughs> clients in the States. And during the first impeachment trial of Donald Trump, Jim was a guest uh, at the proceedings uh, of the Chief Justice. So, so many twists. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, yes. So what, what was uh, Robert Indiana's net worth when he passed away? Well, he had $5 million in his bank account, roughly. That's, what, that's the figure that I've reported, give or take. Um, his estate is estimated to be any, worth anywhere between $70 million and $100-something million. Um, so uh, they burned through a lot of cash when he died to secure the house, to fix the house. It was in awful shape. They had to deal with the roof. Uh, they had to deal with so many, they did all the structural issues with the money uh, that he had. So they burned through his cash. But you can, uh, you can do a lot of roof for 700 yeah. million dollars. Yeah, well, they, uh, yeah, but they did a lot more. But anyway, this, so, so the estate has been described as um, cash poor, but asset rich. In other words, it's all about the artwork and the value of the artwork. And um, we will see what that is worth. That is still to be determined. If it comes out the way Jim Brannon hopes, he will be able to justify his fees. If it comes down a little bit less than that, he's going to have to return some money. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Does he have any heirs? Like, no, family? That, no, no, no. One? Yeah. and that's the issue. Never married, no heirs. He did have a cousin in the Midwest that he stayed in touch with for some time, but lost contact with toward the end. Um, his former attorney, Ron Spencer, who I interviewed a lot for the book, um, really believes this is a case of... And not, maybe not just elder abuse per se, but uh, uh, not having a guardian or not having someone to watch over him. And um, he, Ron wrote Indiana's will that was rewritten in May 2016. In other words, he wrote their previous will that was thrown out. And um, uh, he said he didn't have to be uh, mentally incapable in order to have that will questioned. All you have to do is sign a will under duress in order for it to be contested. And he believes the Attorney General failed his duty in not challenging Indiana's will uh, because he thinks Indiana signed it under duress and he thinks it probably could have been proven. Was, was Indiana primarily a sculptor? No, interesting question. His, some of his best known work are sculptures, but he, was, he came up as a painter and he's a very good, was a very good printmaker as well. But he was one of these artists who worked just as easily two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally actually. Although, I have to say, after he got to Vinyl Haven and started making those, those uh, sculptures from found objects, 
He was not a hands-on sculptor. He designed the pieces, but they were, all those marble pieces were manufactured in Italy. He was sent samples of the material, and he was able to sort of vet the craftspeople who made that theoretically, but he had no hand in their creation. Just like the piece of hope, this big six by six stainless steel that was made in Elliot, he, had, he didn't even see it. He, he approved the prototypes, he approved the concept. He talked to them, he called the, he called the local artists who made it on the phone and talked to them once, and they were at the 80th birthday party as well. But uh, he, he, never, he didn't go to Denver and see it. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. But his paintings, you know, up until all the fraud is alleged, he was hands-on with those paintings. But he always had studio assistants doing work with him and for him, both preparing canvases and also finishing things. So the, the Love, his first famous piece, was fraught with fraud from the beginning because it was a Christmas card for the Museum of Modern Art before he even made it into a painting. And then uh, when he made it into a painting, um, it was several paintings that sold right away. And it really, it is one of the most famous pieces of American art that really is without an original. There was no original painting that he made that everything was based off of. It was based on a Christmas card that was sent out into the world. And then, and then when he started his art show showing the paintings of love, he put out a poster with love on it that was not copyrighted. And once that went out in 66, love became public domain. Mm. So the sculpture of love wasn't the original. Correct. There really is no original love. The sculpture of love in Philadelphia that was installed in 76 is the, like the original public art of love. And there's also one in Central Park that's moved around a bit. So, but there's a lot of loves out there. And just like the seven at the Portland Museum of Art, there's a lot of those number sculptures all over the place. Those are made into, a, I forget how many series. Yeah. Yep. Yes. What's the um, medium that he typically painted in? He painted in oils. Yeah, he considered himself a sign painter. And he painted in, uh, um, he, he was a hard-edged painter. So he painted in uh, primarily oils with a lot of stencils. He used a lot of stencils for his lettering and numbers. And that made his work very easy to rip off. Yeah. Yep, yep. So shapes, colors, words, numbers, that was, those were all his things. Um, he, he wasn't always that way. He started using um, those numbers and letters and whatnot uh, in the late 50s, I think, early 60s. And it created, and that, that's what got him into that pop world, which he hated. He did not want to see himself as a pop artist. He, he resented that because he saw that as uh, something that would not last. It was short term. It was cheap. And that's why he wanted to do the sculptures, because, again, they would last forever. Yep. Yeah, he really didn't take care of his art. And he didn't take care of his legacy, even though he cared about his legacy immensely. And it all fell apart on him. Yep. All right. Yes. It doesn't sound like he had much of a romantic life. Did he? Oh, man. Oh, is this a, a juicy talk? Oh, yeah, we could, yeah. So he did, yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that I realized in writing this book, um, Robert Indiana was with, without a partner virtually his entire life, you know, and you can take that as long as you want in, in terms of his adoptive parents. His adopted parents kept a, a photo of the infant they lost on the wall, and uh, they never had a photo of him, oh, you know? God. And oh, so... Um, you know, that's just, that just wrecks a person. Yeah. And, uh, um, but in, he had many lovers on Vinyl Haven and elsewhere, but he never had a committed partner. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Anyway, that's, yeah, that's a tough topic because it's one of the tragedies. He had a lot of people yeah. in his life that he was int intimate with, but uh, and if he had, then all of this might have been averted. You know, but then you wonder, if he had not moved to Vinyl Haven, could he have lived a different life? I mean, he definitely would have lived, a diff obviously, a different life. But what would it have been like? And, you know, he lost all those connections in New York and surrounded himself with people, ultimately, who did not trust him and whom he did not trust. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, and then we'll pause. When I went out to Vinyl Haven, 
right after he died. So we learned, well, we learned he died on Monday. I went out there on Wednesday. And the first person that I interviewed from the island about him told me they were glad that he was finally dead because he was an odious, an odious presence on the island. And uh, she had teenage kids that she felt now she could feel safe in downtown with. That's what he, so whether he brought that on himself or not, who knows, but that's the environment that he lived in. Well, the case wasn't just abuse, it was a, against him was abuse of, of a minor. Boy. Yes, and correct. So yes. That definitely affected how people thought of him. Like Absolutely, that. no question about it. And as I say, he was judged guilty on the island the day he arrived back from the courtroom. And uh, there's a still a very large contingent of people on the island who resent him. And that's why the, the, the museum for him won't be out there. They'll, they'll, yeah. be, they'll be the presence of the Star of Hope and all that sort of thing. Uh, but I think that the interpretation of Indiana's life and work uh, will largely take place off island, I think. Not entirely. But we'll see. That's to be determined. Mm -hmm. I know you wanted to pop, but I yeah. still don't understand. All his money from his estate went to fix up the Star of Hope, and yeah. yet it won't be used for the purpose. Well, that's what, so, so that's all in the settlement that it's mm -hmm. confidential. So here's the thing. Um, Thank you for that question. Uh, no, one of the things that we are talking about doing at the newspaper is how do we get that settlement opened up so we can see what it says, so we can answer that question. Where did all that artwork go? He left it to the people of Maine. That was the idea. Are we going to get to see it? Who gets it? Will it be on view? Where? What's it worth? Those are all legitimate questions. And the, uh, the lawyers are tricky people. They uh, filed the settlement not, well, they didn't file the settlement. They filed the news of the settlement um, and kept it confidential. So the, it's actually not filed with the court. It's just a confidential agreement among the parties. Um, the Morgan Art Foundation, the Star of Hope Foundation, and the Robert Indiana Estate. Yep. Now, the probate court in Knox County needs to know what the value of that estate is in order so it can determine if Jim Brannon is overcharging. And so the judge, the probate judge, is going to know the value of that estate. And, and then, uh, I believe the main attorney general should be arguing that we all should know what that says. So that is still to be determined. I need to do to some reporting on that. <laughs> left to the people of me? Well, I mean, he, the Star of Hope Foundation is a, is a public foundation in the sense that uh, it was his vision was for it to be a museum that people of Maine could enjoy and so he didn't necessarily leave the collection to the people of Maine right. but the foundation was created with the benefit of the people of Maine in mind and the value of the foundation is based on the artwork yeah so the Morgan Art Foundation owns a lot of it and the Star of Hope Foundation owns a lot of it and uh, but we don't know yet how much of which uh, who owns how much or where it will go. <laughs> or how he died or when he died. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I just yes. want to commend you for how passionate oh, you are. Thanks. about, And you, you're the perfect person <laughs> to well, be the author thank you. of this book. Well, that was the pitch from the publisher. They said, as I said, if somebody doesn't do it, if you don't do it, somebody else will. So you might as well. But you also have, I mean, you're so passionate about it. Yeah. Don't, you have yeah. to look at your notes. Well, well, thanks. Well, I've been living with this intensely for a long time. I have, da I have dates and things committed to memory, and it's yeah. really weird. Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, as I said, I've been writing about this for the paper, and I've always, I always enjoyed his company. Uh, Robert Indiana was a gregarious, fun, enjoyable guy to hang out with. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, I'm very and passionate you about you it. You don't pass any judgment on, on whether he... Is guilty or not guilty? I mean, in the in the in the uh, sex crime thing. Yeah. Well, I wasn't around reporting on it back then. I do want to go back and try to look at some of those case files and maybe interview people who were around then. And uh, because I don't, I, I'm not going to say I haven't passed judgment. I haven't made judgment on that yet. Uh, that's a troubling aspect of his life that we are beginning to learn more about. And the reason I say that is because right in June, one of the last things I added to this book, literally the last week of June, was a revelation. In in court documents um, by another former studio assistant who now lives in Waldeboro who was found guilty of social security fraud. He took money on the side, 
cash from Indiana for years. Indiana didn't pay payroll taxes, and at the same time, this guy was drawing Social Security benefits. So he was drawing this income illegally, and he was found guilty, and in part of his plea deal, he presented evidence that some people think was evidence that was not presented at trial back in the 1990s that might have convicted Indiana. And so he was that he was one of those. Yes, boys. that's what that is what he says. Now, some people think that he is he knew all this backstory because he worked with Indiana for a long time. And many other people think he knows the story so well he was able to present that and was able to steal evidence from the Star of Hope in a couple of years before Indiana died that uh, ex that would have suggested uh, his story is, is believable. I interviewed the prosecutor um, for the feds on this case, they don't, they don't talk, and she would not talk on the record. But I asked her in the brief, she said they had no reason to deny, no reason to disbelieve the witness. And I asked her if she could elaborate on that, and she couldn't, but she said that again. She said, I have, we have, based on what we've seen, we have no reason to disbelieve them. So they think the evidence is pretty compelling. But the people who knew, knew Indiana and defend him say that evidence was stolen. And this guy concocted the story because he knew it. Again, mm. do we know? Will we ever know? Mm. Yeah. It's another story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, an, it's a main island story, boy, I tell you. Yeah. It's a, it is a mystery as much as it's an art book. So hopefully it'll be a movie someday. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes about his relationship with other artists. Um, yeah. Because you mentioned he didn't like how he was pigeonholed. Yeah. Um, would that be any reflection, like, say, on Warhol or some of the other pop culture? Yes, artists? definitely. He was, yeah, he was friends with all those folks. Um, but ultimately, because of the nature of his relationships, he, he fell out with all of them. He resented Andy Warhol in a great way, uh, very, very quickly, because I know we got to wrap up, but uh, Andy Warhol did Sticky Fingers album cover for the Stones in whatever year that was, 69. And you know, that was, Indiana had, was at the height of love at that point. That had come out and he was doing great things. And, but uh, you know, Warhol had this big thing going on and Indiana resented it. Indiana had the opportunity uh, in, the, in the 2010s, 2013, somewhere in that range, to do some jewelry with Jay Jagger and Mick Jagger was going to help fund, I forget the figure, $500,000 investment in making a collaborative project between Jay Jewel, Jade Jagger and Robert Indiana. And uh, he turned it down. He turned, he actually just he turned, turned, he just, down or he just, he, didn't, he just didn't show up for the meeting. Yeah. He didn't show up for the meeting. Uh, a representative of Jay Jagger showed up at Vinyl Haven to have a meeting with him. And so, so he always he bore all these resentments, and uh, one of the he may have done decided to pass on that so he could resent Warhol, yeah. even, even to his death. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, but yeah, when he left New York, he lost all of those those people, and he he uh, he had he had a lot of friends, but I don't know that he had a lot of artist friends in Maine. There weren't many on on. He had a lot of ghost friends. He became very close to Hart, uh, Marsden Hartley in death and uh, sort of started uh, channeling him, but uh, yeah. Ben, did you have a question? No, okay, all right. Maybe you're swatting a bug, huh? All right, good. All right, I think, I don't have no idea what time it is, but I'm sure we're way over. Oh, okay, good. Thanks. But we all want time to chat and also buy a book, and Kelly's up selling the book, so um, please, it's gonna be um, an excellent <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate Thank it. You, Bob. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Very good. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate your being here. <laughs> All right. <laughs>